Welcome everyone to the uh, opening of our day two, Empowering Learners uh, for the Age of AI Conference. Theoretically, we actually had a few events already, but this is typically the keynote in the legacy carryover of physical in-person conferences. Uh, the, the keynote is the kickoff. So uh, welcome all. Now uh, we had a productive day one. We ran into all kinds of time zones, including Europe. We talked teachers and math education and adult learning and the state of uh, AI and education research. We've had different language uh, panels being run as well. Um, so we've had a great overview really globally in some aspects in AI, including a panel that was just done earlier today that sort of looked at underrepresented communities uh, in, in this space as well. One of the things I just want to introduce everyone to, and some of you who've heard me do this day one, it'll be a little bit of review, so I'll keep it short. just want to introduce uh, GRAIL, the Global Research Alliance for AI and Learning and Education. We're a nonprofit stateside. Our interest is taking AI research and putting into practice in uh, actual learning and education settings. We are heavily focused on the leadership end of it, building leadership and leadership capacity, and also a space for developing faculty, staff, teachers, and otherwise. We hold regular monthly events around our uh, sense-making and AI series. And similarly, we have a number of webinars uh, that we've run, everything that covers you know, cognitive escalation. What do we do in the age of AI with our knowledge work uh, to product development? We had Kristen DeServo, who is the, uh, the lead at Khan Academy, who helped develop Khan Migo. And so we really try and bring conversations and topics from ethics to tools to implementation that are relevant to our global community. A bit of a bias towards institutional restructuring, namely the expectation that there's things about AI that likely will have a systems level change. I know we've all heard that from other technologies, so I say that a bit tongue in cheek, but the indicators certainly are that this is a dramatic new entrant into the technology landscape. Some of our partners, these are the university that support us and uh, our charter members uh, you know, that are involved in our overall work and planning. So a particular thank you to all of those members that have been critical to enabling this and making this possible. Um, also want to emphasize those of you that are interested in attending our person uh, in-person event, the Empowering Learners uh, AI conference. I'll drop a link to that in the, in the um, chat form in just a second. Mark down that code ELAI discount. That's a 25% discount on the conference. That's an in-person event. Fantastic group of keynotes, panels coming up soon. Sort of do an in-person on the ground discussion of the state of AI. And finally, those of you that are interested in uh, you know, AI and learning newsletters, I'll just drop this in the chat form as well uh, for anyone that has interest. On that note, I am now going to stop sharing. Mark, if you want to get sharing, I'm going to just do a quick overview and a quick introduction. Um, so, Mark, we're uh, really privileged to have you join us. Um, today, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, his work, which I suspect most of you are, uh, Professor of Education, he's also Director of the Digital Learning Lab at UC Irvine, and he has appointments in Informatics, Language Science, and Psychological Science. He's one of the highest cited scholars uh, in the field of digital learning and related topics, including computer-assisted language learning, digital literacy, digital divide, and so on. Currently, his research team is focusing on generative AI and looking at... <laughs> excuse me, looking at the role of conversational agents to help student learning and also uh, teaching and learning computer science for linguistically diverse students. So fantastic and critical topic areas of research. So thanks all for joining us. Mark, throw it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. Uh, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, <coughs> I just want to briefly acknowledge uh, uh, a number of the people at UCI who are contributing to our research, some of our partners, and our, our, our funder, uh, the National Science Foundation. So uh, let's start with, with a, a look at the big picture. Uh, artificial intelligence is, is considered by economists and others as uh, what's called a general purpose technology like the invention of writing, the printing press, the steam engine, electricity, computers and the internet, etc. All of these general purpose technologies have pervasive effects across many industries and sectors, spark innovations, enhance capacity, and require a great amount of learning and adaptation in order for societies to take full advantage of them. Uh, and uh, they also uh, often have a great impact on, on literacy, uh, as seen by the example of the, the Gutenberg uh, printing press from the 15th century. So prior to that, writing largely meant the ability to copy manuscripts accurately 
And a good reader was someone who could read manuscripts out loud for a public audience. A scholarship consisted of memorization and analysis of a small handful of texts, uh, largely religious texts. Uh, but in the centuries after that, writing became associated with creative authorship. Reading involved quietly comprehending information from books. Scholarship developed as study and mastery of concepts across, across a wide range of, of printed material. Uh, and then another general purpose technology that deeply affected literacy was computers and the internet. Uh, prior to that, reading and writing was largely solitary and paper-based. And as you all know, in recent decades, literacy has expanded to include important new skills such as information literacy, multimodal literacy, and collaborative writing and computer-mediated communication. So uh, the, the recent release and rapid diffusion of ChatGPT, I think, has made clear to, to everybody that AI is, is also a general purpose technology that uh, has a lot of potential impact, uh, not, not only on the economy, but also, as many of us are concerned, uh, with literacy. And uh, in spite of that, the initial reaction within education was less appreciation of its opportunities and more of a fear of its threats, uh, illustrated by this uh, headline, which appeared uh, last December. And then the following month, by January, we got headlines about banning in classrooms. But then in February, people were talking about communicating with AI being the most important job skill of the century. So. You know, it's a contradiction. Uh, is, it, is it a threat or an opportunity? Uh, well, it's probably both. And, and behind that are a lot of specific contradictions. Uh, one, I've done a lot of research on second language learning for many years, so I'm very concerned about the imitation contradiction. Uh, think of a Korean scientist who never majored in English, but now is required to publish and present in, in that language in her entire career for academic advancement and to get her research out. She pays an enormous price in time and money to get her work up to native English standards. And then she discovers ChatGPT, which can cut out so much of that. Uh, but now picture her as a student a few years earlier than that. And here she might be forbidden from using ChatGPT or, or to be subject to misuse of AI detectors, which have been shown to be wildly inaccurate, especially on texts written by non-native speakers. So this is part of what I call the imitation contradiction. English learners are constantly told they need to imitate native speakers, but when they borrow exact phrases from sources, they can be accused of plagiarism. Another contradiction is the, is the rich get richer contradiction, that AI is incredibly powerful for assisting communication, but to get the most out of it, you need to know how to prompt it well, critically evaluate its output, and edit and incorporate it into your work. And then we have the with or without uh, contradiction. If students never learn to use AI, they will be at a disadvantage in their studies and careers. But if they use AI too much and too early, they'll also be at a disadvantage, as they could be robbed of foundational skills necessary uh, to use it well. So all this ties together in what I call the, the June-July contradiction. Now, this is maybe U.S.-centric based on the U.S. academic calendar, but when students are in school in June, they may get punished for using uh, ChatGPT. But in July, when they're out in the workforce, they get be, might be punished for not knowing how to use ChatGPT, as employers care more about efficiency and productivity than they care about uh, authenticity. So how to get around this conundrum? I would suggest that we need an AI literacy approach so that students can learn as they move through the educational system in an age appropriate way to use AI in advantageous ways that better uh, develop their writing, their learning, their cognitive development and in void ways uh, that are disadvantaged uh, to their, their development. And in, in my lab, we've developed sort of a five-part framework for promoting generative AI literacy. And I will uh, briefly go through that. 
So first, students need to understand uh, tools' functions, their strengths, their weaknesses, and biases. I love to start with a simple example of showing them uh, a Gmail autocorrect. I think this is relevant because then people can wrap their head around the idea that it predicts this text only because of pattern matching, because it's looked at, at millions or trillions of other Gmail messages. And I use this as an example to show that generative AI basically works in the same way, except at a much, much larger scale. That way, you know, people don't get mad at uh, uh, auto prediction if it's incorrect or not. They don't expect it to because it's just based on pattern matching. And in a sense, JetGPT works the same way, but on a much bigger scale. Another more particularized illustration of that is this work that was done by Emily Tomford, which instead of working on a large language model, she created a, a tiny language model based only on one book, Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. And she uses this to illustrate how if you train enough times on this model, you can see that uh, the thickness of the lines represents the likelihood of, of certain words coming next. So if you start with I, you're most likely to get would or do, but you might occasionally have am, and then on and on and on and on. And this is a way to show students that ChatGPT is basically a probabilistic model based on relationships that are found uh, in a whole series of texts. Uh, so the next thing is access. Uh, we need to teach students, you know, what the tools are and how to access them. And it's very hard to keep on top of this. Uh, but over time, ChatGPT is going to, well, uh, generative AI for writing will be integrated in. It's already in ChatGPT. It's already in Bing. It's in BARD. And it's going to get in Google Docs. And it is already in Google Docs by subscription. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a little later, I'm going to talk about another tool we're developing called uh, Papyrus AI. So it's going to be very hard to ban it, even if we wanted to, because it's available so broadly. Uh, we have to teach students to prompt. And we just completed uh, uh, a recent uh, case study uh, of a... Uh, a second language writer uh, named uh, Kai Ling, who this is a pseudonym, who uses ChatGPT to all stages of the writing process to brainstorm, to research, to compose, and to, to edit. And uh, this interesting case study in several ways. It 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 kind of shows the uh, new discourses that are emerging uh, from people using the, these tools. So this was a student who did her undergraduate degree in China, and she only came to the U.S. as a graduate student, but she's already uh, writing terrific papers, publications, manuscripts, grant proposals uh, through leveraging uh, the power of generative AI. So she starts off by using it to, uh, to brainstorm her ideas. She asks it to give her ideas related to her topic she's interested in, to elaborate more on those ideas, to share concerns about these ideas, to tell her the pros and cons of ideas. So she uses it as a, as a thinking partner to help brainstorm ideas. And then uh, she wants to do more research about those ideas. And then she uses it as a thinking partner for that. She asks it to give her examples of, of scholars or researchers or themes for their research or which ones are most relevant or give her examples of funded research projects. And then and this is perhaps the part that's most controversial in education. She often uses it to help her, her draft things. I mean, she comes up with a detailed outline and asks it to help her draft things, but she works very, very detailed with those drafts, editing it, changing it, both for accuracy, for voice, for, for putting it in the language that she wants it to be in, and to making sure it gives the exact message that she wants it to do. And then she does one final review, uh, similar to how she might use Grammarly to kind of help uh, uh, revise her academic language. 
So we did a few interviews and observations of her work several months ago. And then a, a month or two later, we did a couple of follow-up interviews, which were quite interesting, how her work with this has changed over time. And she said that uh, I wouldn't necessarily take what ChatGTP suggests because I feel it doesn't look like my writing anymore. And she starts talking about, you know, I, I want to make sure it's my writing, that it's ethical. So she's become a little bit more wary of using it. And uh, but she still really, really likes using it as a thinking partner. And the back and forth interaction helps her develop her ideas. Uh, the next thing is to uh, corroborate. And I want to give a, a couple of examples. I asked ChatGPT to write a bio of me, and of course it did it quite quickly. And the first couple of paragraphs are, are spot on. I think they're a good description of what I do. But it turns out that the third paragraph is completely made up. I've never been a visiting scholar at Harvard, Stanford, or the University of Cambridge. I also tried this. I asked it to come up with the 10 most important papers I've ever written. And six of them were spot on, and, and four of them were made up. So we have to teach students to corroborate. Uh, and that also goes to uh, other forms of, of AI, like deep fakes. Uh, I taught a class uh, last, some, last quarter on artificial intelligence for undergraduates. And here's a class project that two of my undergraduates uh, made. And I'll, I'll play this for you. Good afternoon. I would like to give everyone a perfect grade in this class because all of you are so cool. Also, shout out to Jacob for being the best one in the room. So no, I don't know if, if you could hear this, but he was basic. I he I was these were my that was my voice, uh, basically saying uh, that that everybody should get an A in the class and especially Jacob because he's the best student, but I had never said any of those things. They used AI to create a, a deep boy, a fake using a, a video that I, I, of another video that I had produced. So, Good afternoon. so uh, this, all of this raises the importance of uh, going back, harkening back to digital literacy of a concept that Sam Weinberg and his team at Stanford came up with, which is uh, lateral reading. When we first started to teach information literacy to people, we taught them that they had to dig deeply, deeply into documents, you know, to look at, at, at who produced them and, and what their references were and this and that. But then over time, uh, we realized that that is often ineffective and inefficient. And so now we have to teach people lateral reading or lateral, you know, video watching or whatever. If you hear something that's on the, you can never trust one source alone on the internet, but you have to look at what other people are saying as well. If you hear, you know, uh, you know, uh, President uh, uh, Biden talking about how, you know, he really hopes that Trump will be elected again because he doesn't want to do this job anymore. You know, maybe you have to go and look at what other people are saying and whether that has been incited or quoted or things. Uh, and the last thing has to do is learning how to incorporate. And, uh, you know, part of that is not only checking for accuracy, but uh, checking for bias. Uh, in my lab, we asked uh, ChatGPT to come up with 10 ideas for bilingual narrative ebooks and for young children. And we found, you know, the magical pinata and counting with abuela, uh, those were pretty good titles. You know, the little tortilla boy came across as somewhat stereotyped to us. Uh, here's another example, uh, this time with, with uh, uh, image production. Uh, we used mid, somebody, not us, somebody else used mid journey to say, what does a professor look like? And, you know, there's obviously a biased view there. So people have to carefully think about how to incorporate uh, things into their writing. And uh, I just pulled a couple of examples uh, from uh, uh, the internet. Uh, here's one uh, which was suggested as possibility by one university for to put on syllabus. 
Artificial language models such as ChatGPT cannot be used for course assignment. The following actions are prohibited in this course. Da, 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 da. And here's an alternate view, which I saw from Ryan Baker. Within this class, you're welcome to use foundation models in a totally unrestricted pa uh, fashion for any purpose and no penalty. Having said all these disclaimers, the use of foundation models is encouraged. However, it may make it possible for you, as it may make it possible for you to submit assignments with higher quality in less time. So I realize this changes at different levels and it might be different for elementary school students than graduate students or this or that. But I tend to favor an approach that over time uh, allows and encourages people to use these uh, tools. So uh, some, some thoughts about how uh, we put this all together. And uh, I want to show you a tool we're developing, uh, but first I want to show you a backdrop to some of the, the research we're doing behind this tool. Uh, I have done a lot of research for the last 15 years or so on automated essay scoring or automated writing evaluation. And the reason I and a lot of people have been interested in this is because we see how important individual feedback and coaching is on writing but that a typical uh, college or secondary teacher uh, in the United States, a secondary teacher might have 150 to 180 students in their class, and they just don't have time to give uh, feedback on all of theirs. So for a long time, people have been interested in, and I have been interested in whether there's automated tools uh, that can do this better. And uh, this is it's hard to interpret this, but this basically shows that autom even before ChatGPT and generative tools, automated essay scoring software, most products would correlate better with human scores than humans would correlate with human scores. So it could give uh, scores that, that, other, that humans would be expected to give. That sounds pretty good, right? But there were really big limitations. The first limitation is the way it could only do that on a set of, if it already had a set of essays that were already assigned and scored uh, by humans. So that's why, you know, if you use this software, if you go to unitturnitin.com has a product called Revision Assistant, you can only teach with certain prompts. Students can't write on any subject or write about whatever they want. So here's an example of a prompt. If you want to assign this prompt, uh, you can get a pretty accurate score for students, but, but not on other prompts. Uh, so we wanted to look at uh, whether ChatGPT could give a good score on, on, any, on any prompt. Uh, and we had a, a number of corpuses uh, to look at this. All of these had already been, been scored by trained human scores. And in, in the first corpus we looked at is, you know, ChatGPT was a little bit easier, greater than humans. Uh, but, but I've seen several papers where people have just looked at the median scores, and that's, that's pretty useless. I mean, you have, the, the most important thing is how humans compare to AI on the individual scores of individual papers. So in the first corpus we looked at where we had scores from uh, two different humans, we saw that on a six point scale, they agreed they were within one point of each other about 74% of the time. Well, then we compared the AI scores to the human score. That was within the human score within one point, 76% of the time. And the next corpus, it was 83%. And the next corpus, it was 89%. So uh, this is good. Without any training, it could give scores that were within one point of human scores, you know, about as well or better uh, than humans did. So far, so good. But what about feedback? We all know that feedback is uh, more important than writing than just a score. You know, and just think of how a teacher the kind of dialogic Socratic intervention a teacher can have with a child, talking about their writing, asking them questions about their writing, 
giving them hints and suggestions. But that is really hard to do for a secondary teacher. So can ChatGPT do that? Well, first of all, let's look at other automated writing programs. Uh, while it can be good with scores and limited conditions, it tends to be terrible on feedback. It's confusing. It's generic. So can ChatGPT do that? So we, for our, our first corpus of essays, we had 200 essays uh, where we already had uh, expert human feedback on them. So we fed them to ChatGPT. And we said, pretend you are a secondary school teacher. Provide two to three pieces of specific actionable feedback on each of the following essays written to this rubric that highlight what the student has done well, what they could improve on, and what they can improve on. Uh, use a friendly and encouraging tone. If needed, provide examples of how the student could improve the essay. And uh, here's an example of uh, feedback given. Uh, one of these pieces of feedback was given by ChatGPT, and one of them was given by a human reader on the same piece of writing. Uh, George, do we happen to have any way to poll people? I mean, if we do, I'd like to poll people to see whether they think number one or number two are written by ChatGPT. Yeah, uh, let me not, do a very quick poll. Yep, I'll do it okay. real time. Who wrote, let me give me one second, wrote this. I'll say choice one. Uh, let me see if it'll allow me to do this. Which one did Chat GPT write? Let's try that. Yeah, choice left one, or choice right? Two. Yeah. Yeah. One now or let two. Let me see if yeah, I can okay. launch it. It should pop up on people's screens. So choice one, which is left, is did Chat GPT write it? Choice two. Just going to let it go. I'm not sure if you see it on your screen, Mark. We've got I do. 30, this is 40, fantastic. 40 comments, I've this 50, a, 60. I've showed this a couple times, but never with a poll. So this is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, I, I would like credit for my real-time poll skills, Mark. I would like yeah. that added to any citations that come out of this, please. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, when I uh, recommend you for the Nobel Prize, I'll be sure and put that in my letter. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, I will end the poll. We've got about 80 people that have replied. Are you good for me to kill it, Mark? Yes, that's great. That's great. Uh, and let me share well, the results. Do you see it on your screen, Mark? Well, I, I saw the poll all along, so it's it's hard for me to know whether other people are seeing it. I'll, I'll let you know, people on the screen, um, can, any, can anyone just confirm they see this screen? Okay, I see a few people saying yes. All right, perfect. So okay. choice one yeah. was 40%, choice two was 60%. Uh, and uh, the fact is that uh, the 60% are wrong. Uh, actually, uh, well, let's go ahead and show it. Uh, uh, the left side was ChatGPT and the right side was humans. But you can, one thing that comes out of this is it's pretty hard to tell them apart, right? I mean, we, the guesses were all over the map. So here's the next thing we did as part of this study, George and everybody. Uh, we had another group of experts score the feedback. We showed them uh, the essays written by the students, and we showed them the ChatGPT and human feedback blinded and kind of mixed up so they didn't know which was which. And we asked them, which of these feedbacks was better? Which was based on uh, all the criteria that it was supposed to be based on? Which was clear? Which was accurate? Which covered more of the essential features of writing? And which was given in a supportive tone? And what we found was that, in general, the human AI was rated as, the human feedback was rated as being a little bit better except on the criteria based like chat gpt being software was maybe you know more likely to remember to, to go over every single piece that was supposed to include the other ones human ai was a little bit better but for me these are really really nice results because it's kind of a relief to me you know that humans could do it better i don't think they can do it better in all circumstances but at least in this study they did uh but that ai ai was close enough that it can be really helpful
So this gave us some ideas of, of, of how we could move forward on this. And we have a grant uh, from the National Science Foundation. We're starting with, with university engineering courses. These are all writing courses in the College of Engineering. And we're trying to integrate uh, generative AI into these writing courses, helping these people who become engineers learn how to use uh, generative AI as a, as a partner in writing. And we're developing a, a curriculum and a platform and some professional development. And the platform we're developing is called Papyrus AI. And I, I'm especially excited about it, not only for university, but mostly for K to 12, because university students will find a way to, to get access ChatGPT anyway. But for K to 12, we really need a, a walled garden for them to develop AI literacy. You know, those of you who are involved in computer science education might know what a wonderful tool Scratch is. It's a developmentally appropriate tool for kids to learn computer programming. You know, we need Scratch-like tools for AI literacy. We need ones that were designed for educational purposes. So Papyrus AI basically provides uh, access to ChatGPT, but via uh, API rather than directly, which means it's all private because of the conditions of use, ChatGPT, you know, OpenAI will not save students writing for their own training models, which is really important for students and families. And in pedagogically sound ways, based to the prompts that we will build in so people won't be the students won't be able to use this for anything but they'll be able to use it for two things to get help in planning their writing and getting feedback on their drafts and then instructors will will supplement their own uh, feedback and get a uh, student data reports so it'll start with a, a student interface and won't look exactly like this but they'll log in and we'll try to do it so that the login integrates with uh, canvas or moodle or other tools uh and then we'll ask you know uh what do you want do you want help planning your writing or do you want help uh with feedback on your text and then if it want if we, if they want help planning their writing it might start asking them questions about what's your topic what's your genre what are your arguments what are your out what's your outline what are your sources and they'll have a dialogue about those things have you thought about counter arguments uh have you thought about what's missing from your outline oh where else can you look for sources etc cetera, etc cetera. and then if they say they want feedback on the text it might say great do you want feedback on grammar style organization or content here put your text in uh, and then it will give them uh, suggestions based on the rubrics about uh, ways that they can improve their writing. So we're, we're excited about that. Uh, and of course, we're not the only people. I mean, uh, you mentioned Conmigo. They're developing a much more general tool, and I'm sure lots of people will be developing tools. Uh, the point of this, I think, is that to, to fully develop AI literacy, we need to create scaffolded, tools, especially for, for students. Uh, and if you're interested in this, we don't have anything available that people can use yet, but you know, we hope by maybe next summer. Uh, and then uh, teachers will get reports on uh, all, all the students are using it, what time they're using it, what purpose, summaries of their interactions, et cetera. And then researchers can also access this, will be really, really interesting. Uh, for research purposes. Uh, so we hope that, that this and other tools can really help students learn to write and do other things together uh, with ChatGPT, because our view of tools is it's less important on what people can do at only, absolutely by themselves but what they can do in collaboration with other people and, and what they can do with tools. And I wanna show you a few of my favorite quotations uh, that I think nicely illustrate that. Uh, the first is from uh, Gregory Bateson, and he was a, a very brilliant interdisciplinary scholar who I was fortunate enough uh, God, almost a half century ago, to have as a uh, uh, one of my professors at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, 
the uh, one one time uh, he was brilliant in so many areas that when people you asked him, you know, what's your field, he would say, uh, I don't have a, I'm not a cow, I don't have a field. So I, I've tried to fashion myself as that type of scholar, not nearly as brilliant as him, but try to be interdisciplinary. But he once said, suppose I'm a blind man and I use a stick. I go tap, tap, tap. Where do I start? Is my mental system bounded at the handle of the stick? Is it bounded by my skin? Does it start halfway up the stick? Does it start at the tip of the stick? This is trying to get the idea that what's important is what people can do with tools, not trying to artificially you know, remove people from tools. Uh, similar to that, uh, Walter Ong once said, Tele technologies are not mere exterior aids, but also interior transformations of consciousness and never more than when they affect the word. So this general relationship of technology that Gregory Bateson talks about is even more important when we start uh, dealing with ones that have to do with language and literacy because they're so integrated with, with cognition, with consciousness, with communication. And this last quote I love, and it, it really helped show how, you know, I'm a firm believer in don't reinvent the flat tire, which means, you know, learn lessons from the past and apply them now. And so Shana Zuboff, I mean, when I started doing uh, my original, you know, my first book on online learning came out in the, in the 1990s. And I remember when I did my dissertation on it, you know, one of my faculty members said, uh, you know, Mark, why are you studying online learning? It's so ephemeral. You know, it's going to be here and gone. Uh, but it, it wasn't here and gone. And <clears throat> Zuboff was one of the scholars who I looked at at that time. And even uh, so in the very early days, even be before the Internet, even before the World Wide Web, but in the very early days of the digitization of the, of the workplace, because she did her research back in the early 1980s, uh, she did in-depth multi-year studies of office, factory, professional, executive, and craft workplaces characterized by a shift from to traditional environments to computer-mediated task environments. And she noticed two distinct processes in these companies. On the one hand, as with previous manufacturing technologies, companies sought to automate to increase productivity by removing human agency and skill from the process. But more importantly, and unique to this new stage, companies could also informate, which meant taking advantage of these new technologies to provide more information, knowledge, and skill to employees so that they could have more agency and control rather than less in the productive process. And she found that companies that were best at informating were the most successful. So she summed this up nicely at the end of her book. The informated organization relies on the human capacities for teaching and learning, criticism and insight. It reflects the interdependence between the human mind and one of its most sophisticated productions. As one worker mused, and this was a quote from one of the workers she interviewed, if you don't let people grow and develop and make more decisions, it's a waste of human life, a waste of human potential. If you don't use your knowledge and skill, it's a waste of life. Using the new technology to fulfill its potential means using the person to their full potential. I would suggest that U.S. that AI-based writing, communication, and knowledge production also, or even more so, reflect the interdependence between the human mind and one of its most sophisticated productions. Generative AI, because generative AI is, is us. It's our own words. It's our own language. It's our own algorithms. And that using this new technology to the fullest potential, fullest also means using the person to their full potential. So I challenge all of us uh, to get on with this task. Uh, well, I wanted to leave about uh, 15 minutes uh, for questions, and it looks like the time worked out pretty well for that. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen, uh, and I believe that the organizers will make the PDF of these slides available, and of course the video will be available. 
So if anybody has any follow-up uh, questions, feel free to get in touch with me. But for now, I look forward to uh, having questions and discussion and comments because this is a learning process. I don't feel I have all the answers. I feel like we're all going through this together. So I look forward to hearing your own thoughts, questions, and experiences. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Mark. You're seeing lots of applause and uh, great response to an excellent talk. Um, so those of you uh, drop questions into the forum. Unfortunately, we as in the webinar format, we don't have audio uh, responses for others. So just type them in and I'll direct to Mark. Um, so there's a few questions, I guess, or one particular that came in, which was related to scaffolding. You know, do we need scaffolding or a smarter model? Won't the next GPT-5S tool obviate something uh, like this, which was based, that's about five minutes ago, if you remember where you were at in that part of the talk. Uh, yeah, some of the prompting, yes. Uh, I mean, I think I think these models are going to get get better and better. And so... Uh, we will uh, we will need uh, you know te teaching prompt engineering skills would become you know less and less important. But I do think that the ability to you know communicate well with these tools and drive the process uh, will be will be continue to be important. And I'll share one point that was made here as well, which was, you know, wondering how is AI going to perform, say, a year from now, you know, compared to where we're at now? You know, what are the implications that that might have for sustainability of policies, practice settings, and so on? And, and I, I'll just, the reason I flagged that one in particular is uh, it's very hard to predict the future about anything. It is excruciatingly hard to predict it about AI. Because if you would have asked me, oh, you know, last year, what, how will AI go forward this year? And I mean, no one was expecting you know, GPT 3.8.5 or chat GPT, which landed on our doorstep almost a year ago now. So I think that's a tough one. And then just saw today, uh, there was an argument that Bill Gates was making. And obviously he knows because Microsoft's a pretty massive investor in open AI, but he made the statement that he didn't expect that GPT-5 would be the same landmark uh, improvements that we've seen in the current iterations. Now, of course, we don't know. Even Jeffrey Hinton, who started this movement in its current iteration, uh, misjudged how quickly we would be where we are now. Uh, he was expecting this in 30 plus years time. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that on, on you know, do we do we wait for these tools to keep getting better and better? Or do we do a lot of what you suggested, dive in now, create tools, develop literacies, try it in our, with our students, develop those capabilities? What would be your thoughts? Well, certainly there's no waiting. You know, as somebody who, who's grown up in Southern, I'll use a, a metaphor, somebody who's grown up in Southern California, you know, uh, Everybody always asks, you know, what's the best time to buy a house? And the best time is always, you know, five years ago. And if you can't do it five years ago, do it today, you know, because you're never going to get any. Of course, you know, that obvious the fact that most people can't afford to buy a house. But I mean, you know, there's never any because costs are going up and up and up. You know, there's never use to waiting. Uh, I, I think that. Uh, I, I don't think we should wait a year or two and see how these tools develop because they're they're constantly going to be developing. And I think, uh, you know, I don't think we should get hung up. You know, we're basically, whether it's ChatGPT 5 or ChatGPT 6 or ChatGPT 7, you know, who knows how long these are going to, things are going to be taking, but they're getting better and better and they're getting more ubiquitous. So that means, A, that we uh, can't ban them, and B, we need to uh, seriously teach students uh, how to use them. I think the really, really tricky thing, you know, here's a discussion that I was I came up. Uh, this just happens to be a crazy week for me that I'm, I'm giving a lot of talks. A couple of days ago, I gave a talk on, on research and writing, and I summarized a couple studies. And people here might have seen them uh, that were done in the workplace that showed that if you give, you know, if you randomly assign employees uh, to use ChatGPT or not use ChatGPT, uh, do they, how do they do on writing tasks? And not surprisingly, you know, those who use ChatGPT did them writer, uh, did them better, and they did them faster. And so I was arguing that that's why we have to teach these people these tools. And then the argument's coming back is like, yeah, but are we really improving their writing or we're just 
improving their writing with the tool. Well, that gets back to, you know, it's like, it's like spelling checkers and other things. Uh, these things are becoming part of the, of the writing and communication process. And I think that's the future that we have to get used to. So I think that, you know, that's what frames my mindset is we, as we have to look at what people can do with these tools will become more and more important over time than what they can do without them. And, uh, you know, we have to try to shoot where the puck is going, not where it's not where it is right now. Uh, but wherever it's going, I think we know that it's going in the direction of a collaborative process, you know, because it, if, it, if it ever gets to the point, you know, we're not going back to the to doing these things without these tools. And if it ever gets to the point where, you know, the tools are doing all these things without us, you know, well, I don't know. Then we just, uh, we move on to something else. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, and, you know, the, the technologies with AI, um, I think is particularly interesting is that there are resources and tools that we grow with and uh, diving into it. Uh, interesting argument I heard from a philosopher, I'll see if I can find you are, the link on it recently was, he said, you know, we're talking about AGI and these machines becoming increasingly intelligent. His argument was, you know what, we've created systems that are already generally intelligent. Our government agencies, corporations that function as, as intelligent agencies shaping, directing, and guiding our lives on a daily basis. So the idea that some of these systems are only, or these capabilities to change us as humans is only evident in an AI system overlooks the fact that there's forces bigger. I, I respond daily to artificial general intelligence in the form of Microsoft, Google, IRS, and whoever else that's out there. Um, there's an interesting point. I uh, just want to address the the uh, question, I think you're aware of this, there's two that are interrelated. So I'll start with the first one. You know, what are the potentials of these models for promoting multilingualism or will English continue to be dominant? Well, you know, I, 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 wish, I, I wish I knew the answer to them. Uh, I, I will say, I think they can promote multilingualism. Uh, one, they are remarkably good at translation. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm giving my first talk ever in Spanish a, in a few days. You know, I used to be a Spanish bilingual teacher. I'm pretty good at Spanish, but my Spanish is very rusty and I, I don't tend not to give academic talks in Spanish. But, uh, but now that I have a tool where I could take my talk and just use ChatGPT and translate it instantaneously to Spanish, and then I sent it to some of my colleagues in Uruguay where I'm giving the talk and they looked at it and they said, looks perfect. They didn't have any suggestions. So the fact now, of course, it translates better in, in certain more widely spoken languages than other languages and this and that. But it will get to the point where it will translate very quickly and also orally and instantaneously. Well, that will one of the. One of the affordances of that will it was allow people to continue using their own languages. You know, there'll be less and less situations where they'll feel, you know, even now, right now, that Korean scientist, you know, over time might feel less and less that they have to perfect their English uh, to uh, participate internationally. So I hope it can be used to uh, to foster multilingualism. But I will say, you know, the main current limitation is that uh, large language models are work based on their input, so they're uh, they're much uh, work less, much more poorly uh, with ones uh, that have less uh, written language available to them or that have no written language available to them. Yeah, and that raises a great point as well. Uh, seeing some of the current uh, language uh, audio uh, services such as Eleven Labs that allow uh, cloning of a voice and then having a person repurpose that lecture in different languages, right? It's a little freaky to hear your own voice in, you know, a language you absolutely don't speak, but it looks like you and it's your voice. So uh, that doesn't get at the bias models, which is the next point that's raised in here is um, you, because the models are trained on certain data sets that reflect certain cultures. 
and the idea that uh, you know work that's been done from an equity and a bias end within AI, specifically AI and education. I'm not sure if you want to speak to that at all. We had a pan or a, a sense making uh, AI lecture speaker a few um, few months ago. She was with Tim Nitkabru's Center. And she talks specifically about some of the, the racial bias that exist in those spaces. But I'm wondering if you can talk about any of the equity or bias issues that you're thinking through as you're deploying some of these projects. Sure. I mean, there's also uh, serious gender biases. Uh, there's, uh, you know, international biases in terms of they, you know, they reflect the thought processes uh, where most of the data comes from. But, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why I think we have to promote AI literacy. And I, today I talked mostly about uh, AI as a, a digital literacy, but in our lab we also have uh, AI as a co computational literacy projects where students, you know, get to uh, create and train their own like toy large language models. Uh, and teachers have to be very aware of these and, you know, to the extent that, that we learn to recognize these things, having these biases come out in these pedagogical contexts can also be an advantage because, you know, if, if teachers can help students uh, recognize bias when they themselves are working with AI and creating things with AI, whether it's creating texts or training models or whatever, uh, that's a very, very powerful pedagogical model. So I, I think that uh, it's uh, promoting AI literacy, but in a reflective way when the educators involved can be aware of biases that come out and, and keep their eyes open for them. And, and part of making students aware of you know, uh, AI and how it works is also teaching it about what it's got biases can be. I think that those can be very, very powerful learning opportunities. Great. Well, I'm going to sh ask you one final question, then I want to set the end this part of it and set the stage for for the talks happening uh, the rest of the day. Um, so one question was, you know, putting yourself in the shoes of a curricular developer, how do you know where to draw the line between what humans need to master and what they can delegate to the machine? You know, should his uh, this for his or this individual's one year old daughter be explicitly taught punctuation rules in her language class? Well, it's uh, I I think it it's so age appropriate. You know, I and I don't think it's black or white that we should explicitly or not explicitly. Because there's some things we still do, but we may do less, you know? I mean, I'm not a big fan of teaching cursive, for example, cursive writing. But I am a big fan of, of teaching writing by hand, which in English can be done in print rather than cursive because there are cognitive benefits to that. You know, I think the attention that we give to uh, spelling has changed over time. Uh, because of the uh, extensive use of things like spell checkers, but it doesn't mean we don't need to teach it at all. Uh, I don't think, uh, I still think we need to uh, teach students how to multiply because the, to understand the basic concepts involved, but we might not have them have to multiple, do drills where they're multiplying three or four digit, you know, uh, numbers or dividing three or four digit numbers so that they, you know, develop that sort of attention to detail on these massive multiplication revision problems. So I don't think it's a black or white. I think that they're, and it's very age appropriate, age adjusted as well. But I think it's, uh, it's a general reprioritizing of things with the end goal is our ability to work well with the tools that we have rather than to uh, work without them. Great. Well, thanks very much, Mark, for a fantastic talk. Uh, great comments in the forum. Great questions. Uh, please keep the conversation going into Whova for those of you that like to keep tracking it. I just want to uh, do a quick review of what's coming your way for the rest of the day. Uh, those of you that are stateside on East Coast right now, uh, it's toward the end of the day, but the conference itself is running for the next six, seven hours. So I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of what's coming up as, as things go forward. So next we have uh, Rob Moore from University of Florida leading a session on we should 
should know better strategies to integrate AI into learning, teaching, and evaluation. Uh, right after that, we have a session on AI for math learning. Uh, then following that, we have our second keynote of the day, Anisha, uh, fantastic uh, Bakaria, um, fantastic speaker. She'll give us a great overview of learning and developing uh, these tools with generative AI. I've heard her speak before, absolutely outstanding. Uh, we have uh, Lynn uh, Lipsmeyer, who is leading a few sessions today. One is on AI-empowered immersive platforms with peer support to help address young people's uh, brain health. Then we have an AI and education equity and higher education panel. And then finally, we wrap up this part of the day, at least with sustaining a persistent umbrella AI research program, best uh, practice and lessons over the period of a decade. So there's a lot going on. If you caught many of the panels and sessions yesterday, we've been doing this conference for four years. Uh, it is, you know, to my thinking, our, we've had great programs every year, but this, is, this to me seems like the best program that I've seen at least uh, put together. And I think it's an outstanding opportunity to dive into related sessions. You'll see everything in Whova, as I mentioned at the start, the second half of the conversation happens there. So please jump in and join there. And then as I noted at the start, I will just briefly drop this in again. For those of you that are interested in joining us in person, uh, this is the event that we're hosting in Phoenix in about five weeks time. And there's a discount code, 25% uh, just for people who've attended the conference here. So please uh, jump in, join that. Finally, Mark, outstanding talk. Thanks for getting us rolling today.